Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Pollan. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight we welcome Texas State Senator John Whitmire, who represents the 15th Senatorial District. But more importantly, he's the chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee, and he is the longest-serving state senator in Texas, David. Very impressive. And he happens to be my senator, at least I think so. I'm yeah, and I actually think he claims to be a long-term friend of yours, maybe going back 25 years. Well, I don't know. That's pushing him too hard. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go that far. <laughs> but you do still represent my 43rd Street, do. Uh, do you Gordon Oaks, Gordon Oaks, that's where you live. Ah, good. 43rd and Shepherd. He forgot where he lives, <laughs> Senator. Yeah. And that's why uh, John keeps getting elected, because he knows where everybody lives, you know? I mean, he knows, uh, he knows the neighborhoods. I try hard. Okay, uh... Everything changed uh, September the 11th, uh, 2001, or so they tell us. Um, your, your take on how things changed in uh, Texas. We do know that there were certain things called monstrous lies that happened after 9-11. Well, which, uh, they, they, well, let, let him answer well, instead he, of he to, No, here's the deal. Iraq was, a, <laughs> Here not, Iraq was not true. Tax cuts didn't bring jobs, and we got a lot of debt. Now we have another <laughs> Texas governor who wants to be president. Uh, how does that factor in? Well, what factors in is I'm a state senator, so <laughs> I can't speak to the national concerns, although as an American citizen, we all are involved. And uh, most directly, border security along the Texas-Mexico border uh, became a focal point. Uh, some reports of crossings by al-Qaeda or friends of our enemies, so we regularly each session in uh, enhance the security along our border. It's still very porous, of course, but uh, security at the Capitol. Obviously, how we go to Austin, I used to regularly fly, now I drive because of the uh, challenges at the airport. So, you know, obviously it's affected everyone's life. Well, but, but we talk, my, my, we talk, my point is, but, but the country's in bad shape, in worse shape than, you know, I'm not saying it was caused by the buildings falling. Yeah. Is Texas in better or worse shape since 2001, 9-11? Well, it depends on what's your definition. I mean, obviously, uh, we're growing by leaps and bounds. 1,500 people will move to Texas each day this week. And so we're getting about half a million people uh, a year. I think we have some real challenges that we're not addressing. Uh, public education, dropout rate is uh, way too high. Uninsured uh, children. Uh, Health care is not available to many, so I can go through the yeah. There's a whole the, list. The cost of higher ed. So, so, so I don't know that this is related yeah. to 9/11. I want to I want to go back to 9/11. Yeah, I want to okay. talk about the tone of politics because you've been involved in politics for sure. a long time, Senator. Well, That's well, why you're well, the longest serving senator. Has it changed since 9/11? Is there uh, is it better? The tone better? Able to work across the aisle better? Or are things as they were, always were, or have they gotten worse? The the item that I can mostly direct in my belief, to 9-11 would be the hateful tone towards immigrants that is uh, perpetrated in Austin. Sanctuary city legislation this year, voter ID. Unfortunately, uh, the many thousands and maybe millions of immigrants that we've welcomed to Texas, undocumented immigrants, our workforce, uh, we welcome them up until 9-11. And each year, uh, the tone has gotten more hateful, in my judgment towards these individuals, most of whom are law-abiding, religious, family-oriented, Mexican-Americans, uh, Mexican nationals for the most part. And uh, this last session was as tough towards them as any I've seen. I think this uh, is a result of some of the concerns over 9-11, security. When did you foreign. find out that the American Legislative Exchange Council, funded by uh, billionaires had put forward in 38 states actually voter suppression legislative goals, including shortening uh, early vote uh, periods, photo ID, government ID, citizenship yeah. questions for for people. When did you find out that, uh, well, that things that people were trying to that, suppress that, the voters? Yeah, well, well, they took us. We took us up session four last, and we killed it successfully. Killed uh, what? Voter ID. Uh, legislation after a long debate. Uh, it was the first item that the Senate took up this past session and passed. Very partisan, very political, to me, much to do about nothing. Um, it was directed towards undocumented individuals voting, which I've been in politics my whole adult life. Uh, and it's a very tough races. It's my belief, and I could ask someone to 
show me their evidence, undocumented people don't vote. You, you couldn't drag one into a ballot place. <laughs> now, there may be some fraud in early voting, particularly as it relates to seniors and acquiring their ballots and maybe voting for them without their consent or direction, but same-day voting, which voter ID addresses, I would uh, strongly testify that that just doesn't well, happen. And, 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 and if it did, a candidate like myself, any of us in the political process, we want, we're want we concerned about the integrity of the ballot box. Sure. Well, I don't want fraudulent people voting and, on election day. So if you showed me there was evidence of it, I'd be leading the charge. But it just doesn't exist. But what it will do, because of the requirements to have either a driver's license, which some seniors do not have, you have to have this voter ID. We heard testimony in the remote areas of West Texas. There's not a DPS office. They're not going to get uh, the ID. So it'll suppress, uh, in some people's opinions, 2 3% of the vote, the, most uh, of whom would be Democrats, by the, the way. The studies I've seen in other states that are ahead of us with the voter sure. ID legislation show that it hasn't impacted voter turnout at all. So we'll have to see at I, the end of the day how it works, but we all agree that vo integrity of the ballot is important, sure. and we should... And if we're going to require an ID, obviously we should make it as easy as possible for citizens to get an ID that they can use to go vote. But that I'll dare either one of you get up and go out to the Gessner I-10 DPS office right now where it takes four hours to get a driver's license. So if you want a voter ID and you go to that office or the Tacoma 290, people are not going to wait three and four hours. Now, are there large numbers of people that don't have a driver's license? Yeah, I would suggest senior citizens. My mother never drove. Uh, she voted till she was 86. Uh, early voting would allow her to participate. But if you got to have a voter ID and you, first of all, we still make it real difficult to vote. you got to register 30 days before the election. Now, what's that all about? Particularly particularly now, and I challenge my Republican colleagues, if you got to have this voter ID now to really authorize and document who you are, why wouldn't we have same-day voting? Just get up and say, I'm interested in this race. It's the candidate. You got an ID, show you live in you, Texas? you got an ID, go down and vote. But we don't want... They don't want too many people to participate. More legislative, more legislative talk here. Now, didn't <laughs> didn't the Senate suspend the two-thirds rule in order for that to pass? And wasn't there another suspension of that that uh, Mr. Dewhurst, the lieutenant governor, uh, engineered? Uh, and we now know that he'd like to be uh, a senator and be nominated in a Tea Party primary. Uh, when did you yeah, know Republican that, primary? When did then. you know <laughs> that you were uh, sort of the victim of uh, Mr. Dewhurst's politics. politics? Well, it became very apparent. The first day, uh, Steve Ogden, who was selected as our president pro temp, an honorary position, in his acceptance speech, first day asked us to leave politics at the door, uh, address the business tax, and work on the budget. And uh, as soon as he got through speaking, it became very political. It became very obvious to most of us that the lieutenant governor was running for the U.S. Senate, and of course, Governor Perry was going to be running for president. And you could tell that by the partisan tone of the issues. And the first thing was, to suspend the two-thirds rule to take out voter ID. Well, and it, it passed pretty quickly along party lines. And then we went into the special in June, and we had no two-thirds for a number of issues, sanctuary city being one of them. Uh, but there is no two-thirds rule per se. It's just something the Senate has, has traditionally adopted in order to have business go before the floor. You had to show significant broad-based support. That's the whole theory behind why you've done it. But it's not like a rule but it's a bill you pass, and then you have to suspend rules. Isn't that sure, what we're talking sure, about? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, it's, let's it's talk. I want to talk about... And, it's, talk and, it, and it, 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 I can't... I could spend the rest of the show telling you the sure. advantages of well, the two-thirds well, rule for Republicans as well as Democrats, rural, urban members, well, you, you name it. Or when the where Democrats were in the majority. Sure. And, and I sure. understand that. But let's talk about... You it talked protects about, the rural guys from the urban guys running over them, I would suggest. It also protects them from making tough votes, too. But we'll oh, go. for sure. <laughs> You talked about Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst sure. running for the U.S. Senate. We got Rick Perry running for president. Sure. Let's talk about the politics of all this because it's really quite fascinating, at least to I think to David and I, maybe to our viewers. Uh, what is going to happen if it appears as we head toward the primary that Rick Perry is going to be the Republican nominee for president, and we'll have a, you know a shot, a realistic shot of becoming the next president of the United States? Does Dewhurst then decide, gee, I could just sit back and wait, and, and you know, there's a 50-50 you know, shot, I'll be governor, and I don't have to get any votes at all? Well, I, can't, I, I wouldn't speak for David Dewhurst, but I do know he has that option. I mean, he's running and will, in my judgment, be elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, I think Perry certainly has an opportunity to be the nominee for his party. You're one of two choices. Uh, if he was chosen as president, uh, Dewhurst could uh, go on to the U.S. Senate or 
I've heard suggested that he might say, well, that's, you know, too large a talent loss uh, in the in the uh, legislature, so he might decide to be governor. So yeah. conceivably, though, if Dewhurst goes on to the U.S. Senate, Perry's elected president, the, the, the 16 senators is all it would require. The 31 senator body would select the governor for the next two years from among our body, and then, of course, lieutenant governor. So We could, be, course, we could be talking to Governor Whitmire here, no, what we know. No, 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 well, well, because, well, yeah, be a, it's going to be a Republican, I promise well, you. I don't know who it'll be, but I promise you it'll be a Republican. If the Repo <laughs> well, well, if you look what happened in the state house, you know, the de and originally when Strauss yeah. gets elected, it was a coalition of Republicans and oh. Democrats that elected him. There's no reason why, if there's I division among Republicans, that a coalition of Republicans and Democrats pick the governor. I that would, could happen. I would strongly suggest that. So are you a candidate? No, I, I just you said, want to be governor. I just said it's going to, it'll be it'll be a, it'll be a Republican just because there's 19 Republicans and 12 Democrats. So try those numbers on. It'll be a Republican. And there's not going to be much of a change in the it, numbers. But it might be a coalition that chooses it. I would That's suggest true, that because I mean, we, it take you can hold do, together with 12. We do on good days work very well with each other. We really do. You, you, you get the partisan issues out of the way, and the Senate is still a very d well and deliberative. Uh, conducted body. And did you not have a successful session as criminal justice chair? I, I, I saw three things that you tell me whether you're prouder of others, where we have uh, lineup policies that uh, the police and sheriff's department are supposed to implement uh, to protect against false or phony or bad I identifications. We have the preservation of biological material uh, to make sure that we don't execute the innocent, although Mr. Perry is probably willing to, to do that to be president. And we've defunded some prisons in order to, uh, you know, save money. Anything else yeah. you'd like to brag about? Well, uh, merger of uh, TYC, Texas Youth Commission, and the Juvenile Probation Departments. Six years ago, we had 5,000 youth locked up in youth prisons, essentially, around the state. It's down to 1,400 now. We've demonstrated that if you place money with local ju probation departments, they don't have to send these kids off to remote areas that come back often worse than the ones we sent there. So that was a huge accomplishment. Well, Senator, is that something we can look at in terms of the prison system? Because we spend a whole lot of money in our prison system. And, of course, at one point, and you know from your career, uh, some of your colleagues had an attitude, we just need to keep building prisons forever. Well, you're absolutely right, but we turned that corner about six years ago when we needed uh, three additional prisons. And Jerry Madden, represented from Plano, and I teamed up and convinced the budget writers to allow us to have treatment beds. So instead of the three new prisons, we created 6,000 treatment beds, some at the front end as alternatives to incarceration, some in institute therapy treatment inside, created the first 500-bed DWI facility up in Henderson, Texas, and then on the parole side of it, returned to custody. Right across from uh, Minute Maid Park, there's 400 parolees that in the past would have been sent back to prison for technical violations, now they go there for up to 90 days. So that has uh, allowed us, and you say what I focused on this session was the budget, which the budget the budget was what we focused on because we went there with $25 billion shortfall. But we actually are closing, first time in Texas history, the central unit at Sugar Land will be the first time we've closed a prison. So that's significant that we still have 158,000 inmates locked up this afternoon, 111 locations, but we have... Uh, it's not growing. That's the good news. And at no risk to public safety. We're safer than we have been in the past. Violent offenders are very long, meaningful sentences, but the young, low-level, nonviolent offenders are in more treatment facilities than lockdown. When, the, uh, when we came out of the session, uh, many, many people told us we were able to preserve the rainy day fund for sure. another day. Uh, there were some who said, let's spend it now. Sure. My question is, have we punted enough spending into the next biennium that the rainy day fund uh, savings is really illusory? We, they, the uh, leadership, I voted uh, against the budget just because of the serious cuts to public education, health care, higher education, parks and wildlife. Yeah, we're already being told we'll have at least a $10 billion deficit when we show up uh, at the next session. There's $6 billion left in the rainy day fund, but most of it has already been committed to Medicaid uh, expenditures and now even public education. So we will go into the session broke and with a, with a shortfall. And, of course, you got to find new revenue or make more cuts. And... I think the cuts that we made this session are going to really harm the average Texan 
much more than he and she realizes. Do you think our revenue plan or how we raise money in the state is uh, outmoded no and question. ineffective? I saw where my colleague Dan Patrick was in the paper day proposing raising the sales tax two cents. For public education. Which I disagree with, but at least it shows some progress that he and hopefully other members will acknowledge we are got a broken tax system and that we are not meeting our obligations. If you had your choice and you could, I, if you were, if you were in charge, not, I'd put everything on the table. I'd put everything on the table and let the public have the knowledge that you could replace it with either a combination of sales tax. Uh, you know, the, the legislature, I voted against this uh, a few years ago when we passed the business essentially a corporate income tax that you, unfortunately though you pay it whether you're making any money or not. Right. I think all forms of taxes ought to be put on the table and come up with a package that would give tax relief certainly get away from school property taxes. It's we're, we're already at the point where you can't afford to own a home or a business for school property taxes. But uh, John Sharp studied all this for Perry. They took did not put any personal income tax on the table and essentially they came up with a broken business tax which is not even meeting its obligations that we committed it towards. So you know, my biggest concern as a state senator right now is we're not planning for the future. We're reacting. We're kicking the can down the road. And we need a diverse group of business and civic and labor leaders to sit down and tell us where we need to be and what it's going to take to be sound 5, 10, and 20 years from now. Yeah, how, could you be, how could you do this with uh, the current way that we organize our politics with all these elected officials five or six, you know, statewides and you know, all of them needing, you know, millions of dollars in order to run for office. And we've got Rick Perry, who is an emerging technology sure. fund where he hands out millions in return for millions. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you crack that? It's tough. It's tough. You know, I got elected in 72 by knocking doors. So did Kay Bailey Hutchison and Gene Green, Mickey Leo and Ben Rest. The whole senior member district concept was we would go knock doors in our own respective neighborhoods and get elected. I remember who has signs and who had coffees for me. There's a young lady out of Plano, Texas, a freshman Republican, uh, came to my office to talk about criminal justice and I got to asking her, how did you get elected? Well, I was I'm an attorney, I was a former DA in Plano, and uh, I said, how much did you spend on your race? $1.2 million, state rep. I said, uh, how much of it was your money? $1,000. Now you tell me that's representative government, I mean, it, 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 and it was largely business groups that went in and funded her campaign, but she didn't knock doors and get there representing the community like the way we used to do it. See, we, we're like, and I, and I, I told Gary this, we're like... Which I think breaks the system because you have power brokers that are going to mandate to these individuals, hey, you know, you want to get elected, uh, listen to our issues. And it may not always be the issues that's in the best interest of the public. We got we're, we're going to have an economy the size of Russia. You yeah. know, they take care of about a hundred million people on the same yeah. size economy. We can't take care of twenty-five yeah. million. Well, we're not a broke state. We just we got a broke tax system. But our our, our needs and demands. You know, I got the, the fires in Bastrop going on right now. We cut the Forest Service fire suppression, $30 million last session. I guess we've already spent that money. No, they're begging for money up uh, in Bastrop for the volunteer fire department mm -hmm. expenses and equipment. You know, you, you want to make government insignificant? or what? Inconsequential. Inconsequential? Yes. Well, uh, they, they, they need some government in Bastrop this afternoon. Well, you know, them, to help them with their emergency. When people talk yes. about when people talk about There's social security as, as Ponzi schemes, you know, yeah. well, that doesn't help anybody get sure. an understanding that government can do anything when sure. the leader uh, who wants to be a leader of Gary's party says that <laughs> something we've had for 70 years is a monstrous lie. You know, how do how does yeah. how do people have he, confidence he, he in leading, government? He is leading in the polls in his primary, so he doesn't have he doesn't have a majority. It's interesting, as you, I'm sure you noted, he was called out by Karl Rove. And, and Vice President Dick Cheney on that issue. So they obviously, it's yeah. going to be—it's not going to be an yeah. easy road to the nomination. He, he's for a long ways from the White House. Would you, or you, would you uh, advise Obama to come to Texas, or, or do you hope, given you're up on the, you're on the ballot, that he stays away? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not worried whether he comes here or not. And as regards to my politics, uh, it probably would not be the best use of his time. Would you not suggest, based on his uh, polling data and his past performances in Texas, I'd probably spend it in Colorado and Florida and some of the purple states. What colors what, what, what would you place in? <laughs> we're, we're, Bluish we're, red? <laughs> White states. That's right. I wanted to ask you, as, <laughs> as, 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 as the dean of the Texas sure. Senate, what keeps you up at night worrying about Texas's future? Knowing that there are a lot of people 
that need state services that are not getting them. Uh, so that, particularly as it relates to health care, uh, the fact that we're cutting public education funding, not preparing for growth, and also the infrastructure. I mean, just get, just travel any of our highways. We, we're maxed out. How did we end up and, there? And we, and what, you know, what we did for to build additional highways in the next two years, we bonded. We, the legislature, the Republican majority, bonded $3 billion for future highway construction. Is that so deficit spending? That's definitely deficit spending. So what keeps me up is <laughs> I, I'm, I have a place at the table. I, I'm on finance, and I just see so many unmet needs. And it'd be one thing if it was just a snapshot of where we are now, and we could work to make it better and address it as we go forward. It's growing. The needs are growing, and we're not addressing it. That, and so a columnist... That, that, does, that literally does... Mm -hmm. well, columnist well, Bill well, King, of the, it was in the Chronicle this week, says that the Republican Party is making a serious mistake in turning their backs on... Hispanic populations and... That's and another thing that keeps me up is, is the treatment of people that come to my office in the Heights, how their families are being divided because of the immigration policies of this country. And I'm so disappointed that, that the Obama administration didn't address that as soon as they got there. And you yeah, they know, had a majority. They could have used most of their capital on health care, which was important. But, but I just see the, the hateful division of families. I mean, mothers being in a detention center out near... Uh, Bush Airport because she turned left uh, wrongly and uh, she's got kids here. You know what people don't understand when they come to the workplace and arrest these folks for not being citizens, who picks up their kids at school? You know who who child who, protective who, who services. For, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, Anna Hernandez described it on the House floor that she grew up as a undocumented immigrant with a mother and father that both would not leave the house at the same time because one had to be there in case the other one was arrested. And I'd never really put a, that face on it, but I have people that come into my office in the Heights, a lady married to a U.S. citizen, he leaves her, she's got a four-year-old, she's undocumented, she can't get child support. So I've got to decide, do I encourage her to go to court to try to get child support, or does a U.S. sorry husband show up and say, well, she's undocumented, let's let me have my son and, I, and send her back. So, and these are, these are God-fearing individuals. They were, we, we, up until 9-11, we were welcoming them here. I mean, and we still are using their labor in very essential ways. So that, I guess if I could fix anything today, uh, the budget concerns me, the unmet demands, but the one that really grieves me the most is the uh, not finding a solution for immigration. We have local elections coming up in 2012. Sure. I think you said you're going to be on the ballot the same time yeah, as... Yeah, We'd have uh, redistricting, as, you know. Yes, and so uh, you're going to be on the ballot with... Uh, uh, the county attorney who is Vince yeah. Ryan. You're going to be sure. on with Sheriff sure. Garcia. Sure. Barack uh, Obama. Uh, Barack <laughs> Obama may help you get out some votes. I don't know. But you know what's going to be really interesting is, and in fact, I've heard, even heard some Democrats begin to talk that there would be some hope that Rick Perry would be the Republican nominee because Bill White beat Rick Perry pretty soundly in Harris County. So you want to energize that Democratic base. Uh, Rick Perry might very well do it for us. Now, I would assume he'd energize, maybe or maybe not, the Republican base here. I won't speak <laughs> for that base. But uh, if Perry was a nominee, it would be a real free-for-all in Harris County and could actually enhance the Democrats' chances. So, now, I think that we'll see. Maybe uh, they know him too well. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Uh, <laughs> now, I you know, understand. Did, you know, that, you know our, our, our governor got 39% of the vote when he ran for election four years ago. I remember. And I just don't think K and M knew how to campaign, nor, nor Bill White. So, hey, but I'm, I'm going to hand it to him. He's turned in. I saw him speak in San Antonio last month. Rick Perry? Na yeah, to the National Conference of State Legislators. I was on a 10 o'clock panel, so I got there early at 8.30. He spoke to about four or 500 representatives from around the country, and uh, let me tell you, he's got his message down. It resonates with a lot of people. They interrupted him. Most, a lot of Republican state reps, but I came out of there and I told a reporter who asked me for my opinion, I said, I'll hand it to him. He has a message that's resonated, the, anti, the same thing that he ran against Kay on, of anti-government, frustration, um, and, you know, if he can... Let's have, let's, we so, can so let's see We can talk about secession, or we can have vanity. We can't see can, if he's going to be president. We can put the Confederate flag on our license plate. I wonder if he's going to appoint a guy that's going to break the tie there so that we can have Confederate uh, license plates 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm not I don't advised. know if David would order. I'm not advised. advised. I'm not advised. Uh, I did want to. You mentioned the highways, the yeah. bonding, the deficit spending. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have no current funding in our highway budget to spend for anything, and the highways are deteriorating. Uh, why got, is it that we don't? I mean, one of what a couple of your colleagues have talked about. We need to redo the gas tax or car mm -hmm. char, charge per mile or something because cars have gotten more efficient. Mm -hmm. Why don't we hear more talk about connecting? Paying for services and getting what you want. You got 15 people. seconds to answer that one. <laughs> Jeff Whitworth, a Republican from San Antonio, good friend, told me years ago when we needed more revenue, six, eight years ago in a meeting, he said, Whitmer, we did not build the Republican Party to become the majority party over the last 30 years. And now that we have become the majority party, we're not, the first thing we're going to do, we're not going to raise taxes. So they campaigned and built themselves in the majority party campaigning against taxes, and now they're not going to turn around and say, well, we are the majority now, and guess what? We need a tax. Thanks for the long question, Gary, and the it short answer. I like the answer, anyway. and I guess the roads will have holes. We invite holes. you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. <laughs> Click on the local program bar, red, yeah. white, and blue. Watch the shows. Follow up discussion with mm. the senator and uh, with Gary and I, if you must. Uh, and let me remind you, on a program note, we'll be off the air for a few weeks to make room for Houston PBS in September. Membership drive. Send money. And during the month of October, we'll be discussing each week the different issues and candidates of the 2011 City of Houston Municipal Elections. Until next time, get informed and get active.